Right. Okay. I'm sending you live now. Uh, two seconds. And all the audio is live if, if Martin wants to talk. Yeah. Yeah. And you're live. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to day two of our Biophotonics and Imaging Graduate Summer School. Um, and uh, this morning we have uh, uh, Professor Martin Booth and uh, uh, Karen Hampson from Oxford, who are going to talk about advanced microscopy. So you'll have learned about the basics of tissue optics from Steve Jacques yesterday and microscopy from Laura Waller. And we had some very intense sessions with lots of questions. So please uh, do submit your, your questions in the Q&A on the right hand side. You should have a bubble somewhere with a question mark on it. If you click on that, you'll be able to submit questions. I'm going to hand over to Martin, who's going to take you through the first couple of slides and Martin Booth, that is. Uh, so go for it, Martin. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, so you will recall from the slides we went through that we looked at the uh, some basics of uh, microscopes and how they may have special properties which differ from general imaging systems. And we looked at the um, illumination aspects and the detection aspects. And particularly, we looked at the properties of objective lenses and how we can use those to determine the um, resolution properties of microscopes. Now, while in previous sessions you've discussed uh, the concept of resolution in imaging systems, we introduced some um, extra concepts here which are relevant for microscopy, particularly the sense that we need to think in most microscopes for biological purposes. We need to think of these systems as being three dimensional imaging systems. So they have resolution in three dimensions. And so we looked at ways of estimating using appropriate approximations, the resolution of these systems. And one important point here is that um, when we talk about the resolution of a system, we often have to define carefully what we're talking about. And the common way, one most common way of defining resolution is in terms of the separation of two separate point structures. And we explained in the talk how we could use the Rayleigh criteria to determine whether two point objects um, would be resolved if they were closely placed within the image. Um, now, when we look at the microscope in as a three dimensional imaging system, we see that the resolution is different in the lateral direction than in the axial direction along the optical axis. And we presented some approximations, some rules of thumb, which you can use to estimate what the resolution can be in those different directions. And um, saw that in the axial direction, the resolution um, is always, in practical situations, always larger in size than the um, lateral resolution. And so we posed a question to get things started for you to look at in order to um, determine what uh, properties of objective lenses would be appropriate for a particular imaging task. So I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Karen Hampson, who's going to uh, talk through these and then we'll both be available to answer further questions as we go along. Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll be going through this this question um, so that yes, yeah, so the question is, so you have a two a structure with two micron in diameter and you're using 600 nanometer illumination for the light. So what is the minimum NA required to resolve these structures? Um, so my slides are not moving on. I don't know if my screen is frozen. Um, so here we have the, so this is just a reminder about the resolution. So, so the Rayleigh resolution criteria says that two objects must be separated by the radius of the airy disk. So on the left, we have the diffraction limited image of a point function. And so the area and the airy disk is the, the central part. So on the left, we have a diagram that says resolved and you can see that the images of the point objects are quite separated. Um, and so you can see that you could easily resolve those. Now, as you move them close together, 
Um, so, for example, if they're the radius of the Erie disk apart, you can see that you can just about resolve that there's two point objects. And this is the limit of, of this is the diffraction limit. And then if you move them closer together, then you get an unresolved object because you can't distinguish these objects separately. Um, so, so this is um, the image from, so we have a microscope objective on the right, and this is the image of the point spread function. So there are different ways to define resolution, and there, there are slight variations on the formula. So in different places, you might see different formulae depending on um, where you define this, um, the size of this point. So for example, you could take the full width half maximum. In this case, we're using the formula where it where the radius goes to where there's from the peak to zero intensity. So the lateral resolution was given by this formula at the bottom. So it's 0.61 lambda over NA. So now if we look at the axial resolution, so we have here 2.44 n lambda over n a squared. So as I said before, that these um, these equations do vary slightly. So it depends on how you define the size of this spot. So often you'll see that that 2.44, you'll see that, that that actually could be two for this scaling factor. So this is the answer to the first question. So I've just I've just put in the the parameters for the equation for to the two equations. So I've put it put in the um, the wavelength. I've put in the radius of these the size of these points, and you can see that these are the two NA values you'll need. And so the minimum NA to resolve both of these would be 0.6 um, NA. So you take the largest of these values. So, um, of course, what's in, important in this um, situation here is to realise that the question was um, more complicated than it seemed, of course, because this the resolution in this microscope is different both along the optical axis and laterally. So you see that depending on the position of these objects in three dimensional arrangement of them, then um, you would you would be able to resolve things differently because of this difference in the lateral and the axial resolution of the microscope system. And this is an important point to realize is that the resolution of the system depends upon what the objects are you're trying to resolve. So if you were trying to resolve in the, the Rayleigh criterion is defined in terms of resolution between two point objects, but the um, if you were resolving in a different way, for example, planar objects along the optical axis, then you would have different um, calculations as resolution. So the expressions we gave you and other expressions you find are usually approximations. They are rules of thumb, which give you an idea about what the resolution of the system would be. But an important takeaway message as well is that whether or not you can resolve objects depends on other factors too, including the size of the objects and in practical systems, the, the signal level. So often in microscopes you have low signal level and if the, if the signals are um, at the level, similar levels to the background noise, then you will find it even more difficult to resolve um, objects then would be told just purely from the resolution calculations. OK, so I think we can uh, take some take some of the uh, questions now. I can see some of them have, uh, have come up here. Um, All right, shall I read them to you, Martin? And yes, uh, then, then we go. Uh, just staying on the point you had there, it, it, is the signal to noise? Um, yeah, so the noise coming up, is that is that all? Is that uh, very similar to uh, widening the points, point spread function? You know, if there's more noise, or is that a very different thing? Um, it could have an effect on widening it, but it's mainly to do with um, the the detection. When you're when you're down at um, low signal to noise ratio, then mm -hmm. you have various sources of noise, such as just electrical noise from your detector, your camera. Uh, but also photon noise. The fact that your photons are arriving in quanta means that um, you have uh, additional sources of Poisson noise in there. All of these things, they effectively would 
would make it difficult, more difficult to resolve things. And the, the net effect would be that uh, you would start, it would be more difficult to sell things apart, partially because rather than seeing the very well defined intensity profiles we showed in the slides, they would become fuzzier because of the noise. And if they become fuzzier, it's harder to resolve them. And in effect, it means that your the, the effective point spread function in that case would be broader. OK, so let, let's go to some of the questions and Karen or Martin jump in and answer as you as you feel appropriate. Uh, I have uh, Ati, Ati Kazari asks, I have calculated the minimum NA as 0 0.18 in order to satisfy the lateral resolution based on the Raleigh criterion. Uh, this is from your part one, question one. So I guess they're asking, are they the right? Is that the right answer? Uh, you're muted, I think, Karen. Uh, yeah, point one eight. Yeah, that, that's the right answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, truly, uh, Chatterjee, uh, and my apologies for my pronunciations. Could could you also please explain what is the significance of a tube lens and when it needs to be considered? Um, yes, so uh, when you're using uh, most high quality modern microscope objectives are infinity corrected, which means that on their own, they are designed to produce collimated light coming out of the back of the lens. This means that the image produced by them would be an infinite distance away from the lens, which is not very useful in a microscope where your camera is a finite distance away from the lens. So the tube lens is placed in there in order to come to create an image from this what we call infinite conjugate space. So it takes the image which would have been created infinity and brings it much closer, which is the plane to the plane where you're going to place your camera. So that's why the tube lens is included there. In older types of microscopes, and indeed still some microscopes you find now which are simpler, there is no need for a tube lens because the um, microscope objective lenses are designed to be finite conjugates. So you can create an image as a camera with just the objective lens. But high quality, high end systems don't use that principle and they use the uh, infinity one space. I think I would just put up the slide there to show you a diagram of that. Great. Uh, so the, the same uh, questioner is asking in the presentations you mentioned that the lateral resolution of a confocal microscope a microscope is PSF squared, so could you please explain why this is the case? Yes, so the PSF in this case, we're talking about the PSF of the conventional imaging system. And the, in the confocal microscope, the point spread function there is proportional to the point spread function, the point spread function of the conventional system squared. The reason for this is essentially because in a confocal microscope, you have two imaging systems. One is the system, these imaging systems work through the same objective lens, but the first one is the illumination system, which images the point source of light coming from the laser into the specimen. The second system is the system which images that the fluorescence generated in the focus there onto the pinhole detector. Now, each of those imaging systems on its own has a point spread function which is the same as the conventional imaging system. When used together as a confocal microscope, the equivalent point spread function becomes the PSF squared of the conventional system. So that's where the squared comes into that. It's because of this, if you like, dual effect of the illumination path and the detection path, both contributing to the resolution. OK, great. So Meng Li from Sweden, uh, and it's great to see the countries mentioned. <laughs> we, we have people from all over the place. Um, why is the fluorescent microscope used and what is the difference between phosphorescence and fluorescence? And is there a phosphorescence microscopy? Um, so fluorescence microscopy is used for, for um, biological imaging because it allows us to um, attach particular markers to structures of interest inside living specimens, inside cells. So there are a whole wealth of tools which allow you to specifically label parts of the cells of interest. So you know that when you see a particular fluorescent dye in a specimen that you're looking at a particular structure in a cell. 
And these things are incredibly versatile, so you can have highly specific to attach to, say, different DNA or different proteins <coughs> itself. So that's why they use fluorescence. It's an incredibly useful specific uh, labeling mechanism, which can be tailored to particular structures. The difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence is, is, um, is to just to do with the photophysics. In phosphorescence, the, well, the length of time through which uh, most of these dyes undergo fluorescence is on the order of nanoseconds. So between excitation and light emission is nanoseconds. In phosphorescence, the only real difference is that it follows slightly different processes and is hence a much longer time between excitation and emission. So um, I believe there have been applications using phosphorescence in, uh, in imaging, but they're far less useful. So fluorescence is the ubiquitous uh, method. OK, why is the axial resolution greater than the lateral resolution? Um, I think the simplest answer to that is to do with the um, just the fact that this is the nature of the physics of focusing. And because we have, as you can see in the diagram, the, uh, the focusing angle is uh, is narrow and you have this focusing cone. The nature of the of the uh, light concentration means that it is elongated more along the optical axis than it is laterally. If you were able to design a lens which actually illuminated from all angles, so as if you know, rays were coming in from every direction in a sphere, then you would have a, an isotropic point spread function. It would be have spherical symmetry. But lenses aren't like that in practice. We have to focus through a focusing cone. The rays go through a cone, and therefore we end up with a, a, um, a focal spot and point spread function which is elongated along the axis. OK, uh, Atrilli wants to know if you could comment on how it's possible to distinguish between aberrations and light scattering or interference from differences in refractive index. Um, I wonder if I hand over to Karen so she may answer some questions now as well. Yeah, hi, sorry, um, can you, uh, do you mind repeating the question? Yeah, so could you please comment on how it is possible to distinguish between aberrations and light scattering or interference uh, from differences in refractive index? Um, so the light scattering, so what you tend to see in your image with light scattering is kind of like a fuzzy background on your image. So the, there's lots of scattering throughout the sample, whereas um, aberrations mainly so if you were if you were to look at the point spread function for example scattering would be represented by a kind of halo around the point scripts point spread function whereas the aberrations would, would mainly be the effect on the point spread function in the middle mm -hmm. okay very good um so when using an alternative uh, resolution measures such as full width half maxima are they applied to this in the same manner, i.e. is the image defined as result when two point spread functions are one full width half maximum apart? Uh, yeah, yeah, it will, it will be just in the same manner. There's a the similar sort of derivation. OK, um, many people are saying thank you for your wonderful lectures. I, I will skip those and get to the, the questions themselves. W would wide field microscopy work well in dynamic situations such as imaging and moving specimens and why? Uh, yeah, so wide, wide field w would still work. Um, so, why, so if your specimen was moving, um, if it was moving quite fast and then if your exposure time for the wide field was quite large relative to the movement, what you would typically see is an image blurred out. So if there's a lot of movement, you're better off taking a, a quick um, a, a quick image to minimise that movement. So it still would work. Um, the other uh, option is to have some sort of tracking in the system where you the optics, you have some uh, kind of scanning that moves with the image motion. But yeah, you, you, it would work in wide field, but you'd have to have a short exposure. OK, uh, do lens manufacturers have control of the shape of the I guess that means point spread function. Uh, if yes, can advancements in lens glass material improve the point spread function or shape, or does it, or is it enough to choose a lens based on the NA? 
magnification and other info on the lens barrel. Um, so the, the objectives do have the, so they have correction collars where they can correct, they have some correction over the spherical aberration, um, but the objectives are optimised to give a, a nice focus spot for that given numerical aperture. But the, yeah, some of them have the spherical aberration correction. Yeah, I should um, add to that, it's an interesting question. The the lenses should be designed to operate at that, and if they've been, if they've been made within the correct tolerances, then they will provide a point spread function similar to what you would calculate. Practice, when you when you actually look in detail at these things, you find out that um, there is variability between lenses. And um, whilst manufacturers will not tell you this, if you buy two seemingly identical lenses and analyse their properties, you will find measurable differences. So it's all a question of whether the whether the manufacturers have really met the specification or whether they've interpreted the specifications loosely. And you may find very small changes in numerical aperture. You may find uh, very small residual aberrations which create um, distortions of the point spread functions. But in theory, the lens, high quality, expensive lenses bought from reputable manufacturers should provide you with a point spread function very similar to what you would calculate. Hi, uh, the next question is, do face contrast microscope and dark field microscopes have anything in common? Um, face contrast and dark field, well, they, they work on different principles. What they would have in common is the basic imaging system consisting of the objective lens and the other components of the microscope would be fundamentally the same, but they use different ways of uh, preparing the illumination in the dark field case, where you illuminate with light at higher angles than the focusing cone of the objective lens. And in phase contrast, you would use additional optical elements in the path in order to convert phase information into interference effects, which you can then see on the image. OK, thanks for that. Uh, we have a next question from Motasam. And he asked, like, what are any considerations when it comes to light cells versus fixed cell imaging? Considerations between live cell and fixed cell imaging. Yeah. Um, it's a very broad question, but I suppose the main points would be um, with live cell imaging, uh, the would be a key one would be phototoxicity. In other words. The more you expose a specimen to light, the more you perturb it and even start to damage it and kill it. Um, so light levels are more critical in live cell imaging. You may also have, um, of course, if it's live, you will be looking at dynamic events. So speed of imaging will be important, whereas with fixed specimens, nothing moves. So you can take as long as you want and expose as long as you want. There are very many, um, let's say, biological aspects to dealing with this as well, although we'll stick to the uh, the optical aspects here since that is our, uh, our expertise. OK, OK. Uh, we have another questions from Ata Cizari. So he says like in part two, slide 16, the concept of low frequency information is not very clear to him. So could you please explain what kind of information from the sample can be obtained by the low frequency information? Uh, yeah, I'll just share that slide. Um, uh, so is this the slides you were referring to? I think is this the one? Uh, yeah, I think this is the one. I mean, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so the key with um, structures illumination is so uh, so on the right, imagine you had a, a sample with high frequency information. So imagine lots of small cells packed closely together. 
Now these, um, so if you try to image these through the objective, these might be blurred out because the resolution required would be higher than the resolution of the objective. So this information wouldn't pass through the objective. Now, if you put, if you illuminated the the sample with high frequency, um, a high frequency pattern, then what you would get on the right is this interference pattern, and it's called a, a the Moiré effect. So you can see on the right there's curved lines. Now, if you look at the space in between these fringes, then you can see that the it's much lower resolution than the original high frequency information on the sample. So this can be passed via the, so this will be passed by the objective because it's not beyond the resolution of the objective. So afterwards, of course, there's a lot of processing that needs to go on to obtain the original image, but that's how, that's the significance of the low frequency information. It is, it's, it's making it so that the high frequency information in the sample is encoded in this low frequency pattern that's passed by the objective. And just to, just to add to that, this links into the discussion we had earlier about resolution. So we're talking about there are different ways to define the resolution of a microscope. And um, one way to define resolution is to look at the spatial frequencies, there's the frequencies we're talking about here, the structures which are in the, in the um, image, in the object. And any imaging system based around a lens will act as a low pass filter. In other words, it will only let through spatial frequencies up to a particular value. And that means the finer features in these higher spatial frequencies will not pass through the lens. So what that means is the images you see on the left here um, would would not actually pass through. Although they're in the specimen, those, this information will not pass through the objective lens towards the camera. However, the image on the right where you see this moiré effect and these lower frequency patterns will pass through and that can be detected. So what we're basically saying is we're taking information which is out, which is beyond the resolution of the microscope and then using this structured illumination pattern to transfer that information into the frequencies which can be imaged by the microscope. And then afterwards, we need to decipher that through computational steps. OK, OK, that's perfect. So does that mean that the entire process is like computationally extensive and. So you need more computational power. Yes, the, the computation is essential for the reconstruction of those images and um, to the extent that if you are doing well, if you were doing um, three dimensional versions of this structured illumination imaging, you need a minimum of 15 images in order to reconstruct one frame. OK, that's okay. 15 images will be taken with different structured illumination patterns on them. OK, thanks. So Luca Rogeli has a question. How do you experimentally measure PSF? What kind of samples one has to use? Um, so you could um, so you could image a, a small bead and then um, if you image that bead through the system that should give you an idea of the point spread function. So it, if you use a small point object and image that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have a few questions here. Mm. OK, the next question is from Sweden. So uh, thank you very much for your lectures. Okay. Do lens manufacturers have control on the shape on the PSF? If yes, can advancements in lens glass material improve the PSF shape? Or is enough to choose a lens based on the NA magnification and other info on the lens barrel? I think, I think we already had that question a few minutes ago. We've already addressed that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, uh, sorry about that. So the next question is, is it always important to consider the axial resolution or can you in some situation get away with the on get away with only looking at the lateral resolution? Um, so so is the question um, so if the if the is the question about um, so why why would you need axial resolution? Um, uh, is that the 
the question. That's another way yeah. of looking at it. Yeah, um, I think he means like uh, is axial high axial resolution always necessary? So maybe I think he meant some specific imaging applications. I think if you were imaging a, a sample where there were um, where there were structures at multiple layers, then it would be very important to have axial resolution. But if all your structures were on the surface at a single layer, then it would it wouldn't be necessary. So it depends on the structure, on, on what you're imaging, how thick the specimen is. Is it possible also, Karen, that, that you'd want um, low axial resolution in the sense that you'd want to integrate over a larger volume in order to get enough signal, for example, or are there situations where you might want lower axial resolution? Um, the, I, the only situation that comes to mind is if you, so I know in OCT, if you want to, um, sometimes you want a, a really large depth of focus. Um, so that might be the situation. Uh, maybe Martin. Um, yeah, I suppose there are, there are applications where, I can think of applications where you want to do rapid imaging of volume. Now one problem, one, one big advantage of these types of microscopes is that they give you three-dimensional resolution. You know, if you do those resolution calculations, they tell you that usually the depth is less than a micrometer, which you can resolve. Now that's great if you want to resolve fine three-dimensional structure, but it's also a problem because you can only see light from a very thin plane. So if you want to look at thicker specimens, then you need to, you would need to scan in three dimensions, which takes a long time. So people have um, developed methods where you can use a method called extended depth of focus, which allows you to see, essentially a projection, many more depths. With the same lateral resolution, you can see much more depth at the same time. And this allows you to image much more quickly. So you could observe, for example, fast processes in neurons in a brain um, at a, over a volume at a speed faster than you would do if you had to scan in three dimensions. Very good. Continue, Anand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to use the equations of lateral resolution and axial resolution for all microscope systems? Um, so it, yeah, it depends on the microscope implementation. So the so for example, the question we went through. Um, wouldn't be the case for a confocal PSF. So we know, so in confocal, we, we, we know that the PSF would be squared, so we'd have to apply that factor um, to the calculations to get the true lateral PSF. So we could use them, but we would have to apply some sort of correction, corrective factor, taking into account the, the type of microscope implementation. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sergey Alexandro has a question. If very sensitive detection is used to detect difference in intensity, could resolution be better than Rayleigh criteria? Sorry, you're asking what was the, the question again? Whether uh, if be better very than... sensitive detection is used to detect difference in intensity, could resolution be better than Rayleigh criteria? Um, if if you rephrase that question of saying, can you resolve two point objects? Remember the Raleigh criterion is defined in terms of point objects. Can you resolve two point objects which are closer than the Raleigh criterion tells you if you have enough light? I think the answer to that is yes, um, because if you have enough light, you would have you would have enough signal to noise ratio to determine the shape of whether these two point spread functions are indeed overlapping. The Rayleigh criterion is just an, a one particular way of defining this, a sensible compromise, if you like, saying where these things would be easily resolved. Um, if you if you have much better information, as in very lots of light and high signal to noise ratio, and you know a lot about your point spread function, you should be able to resolve two objects close, two point objects close together than the Rayleigh criterion. But this is a very highly, this is a very highly, um, what you might call optimized physical scenario, which isn't really very practical representation when it comes to genuine 
imaging tasks in a microscope. And so this is an important thing to realize is that um, whilst you can find theoretical studies and theoretical ways of doing these things, it doesn't necessarily translate into something which would be useful actually in biomedical microscopy. So that's where the divergence between theory and what might be able to be done theoretically and what actually happens in practice and what can be done in practical situations. OK, thanks. So we have a uh, next question from Ongun Arise. So he's referring to the lecture three. So he asked like, Cernike polynomials, do each of these correspond to a particular aberration as they are named accordingly? And is it possible to extract Cernike polynomial coefficient to assess aberrations contributing to the image from a set sack? He means 3D PSF. Also, um, these polynomials named after the inventor of phase conduct microscopy. Uh, yeah, so so each of the um, each of the polynomials uh, polynomials represent um, a, a different type of aberration. So, for example, um, defocus is, is like the wavefront is like um, a bowl a bowl kind of shape, and each of them have a different effect on the image. It is possible to determine the aberrations at different depths. So, for example, when you go um, deeper into the sample. The, the, the light will pass through all the layers in front of it. And so when you take the aberration measurements, you'd be measuring the sum of all the aberrations um, of the layers in front. And this would change with depth. Yeah. Great. Uh, is it possible to have simultaneous two photon absorption and three photon absorption for the same sample? Um, so. It is possible that if you have a particular fluorescent dye, then the wavelength required for, and it's normally excited with a wavelength of lambda, uh, that would be the normal single photon excitation wavelength. Then the two photon excitation wavelength would be two lambda, and the three photon excitation wavelength would be three lambda, which means for a particular dye, to get simultaneous two photon and three photon excitation, you would need to have two different lasers. Equivalently, if you only had one laser at a particular wavelength, then it may be able to excite two different dyes, one in two photon mode and one in three photon mode, but those dyes would have to have normal absorption wavelengths at different wavelengths. In other words, if the lambda was the wavelength of your laser, then the two photon would have to absorb at lambda over two, and the three photon would have to absorb at lambda over three. So there would be ways of doing this, but not with the same laser and the same dye. Okay, great. So we have a question. Uh, can you please comment on axial and lateral resolution in terms of spatial resolution? Um, I'm not sure what that question is referring to. The lateral uh, axial resolution are forms of spatial resolution. Yeah, I think the, the, direction. the person who asked what they want to get the idea of spatial resolution, I think he's confused, like if spatial resolution is same as axial resolution. Or... Yeah, maybe they want to know about voxel uh, resolution, but that that again is is just um, is just a, a cube or a, a, such a shape, um, depending on the the yeah wh where the sides are the lateral and axial resolution I, I think that that has been answered perhaps already so maybe we can move on yeah. um julia mathes wants to ask a few questions what, what are the criteria for choosing a specific director uh, detector uh, pmt or apd for a for a certain setup and could you explain uh, more deeply the zernica polynomials and, and I think a previous questioner asked whether those um, wh whether that technique was named after Zernica. So, well, let me I'll, I'll answer the part about the detector, and then I'll hand over to Karen to answer about the, the Zernicas. So, the, the question about well, how do we choose whether we use a PMT or an avalanche photomultiplied tube or an avalanche photodiode? Um, 
in many cases they would be interchangeable they will have there'll be various different properties to look at one is the you know, which wavelengths they're sensitive to and um, which what their for example their efficiency is their quantum efficiency um, but in principle you can use either and um, depending on other factors you would choose one or the other for a particular microscope both would be appropriate for the light levels in fluorescence microscopy so Karen yeah. yeah, I'll just share my screen. Um, yeah, so so yeah, so these are the Zernike polynomials, and they were named after uh, Fritz Zernike. Um, so each of these polynomials describes the the shape of a wavefront. Um, so the wavefront is the shape. If if you were to take all the rays and you were to draw a line through all these rays at 90 degrees to the work you would get the shape of the wavefront so i'll just show you this diagram again so here you have an aberrated beam sorry and Karen. Uh, your screen's just not shared with the students yet it's just oh, right. oh okay um uh has it, has it loaded yet uh it's coming up now Perfect. There it is. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so this diagram just shows the the aberrations and you can see here. So if you look at the diagram on the right, if you were to draw these rays, um, so here's the rays traveling along through the objective and the the wavefront is the line at 90 degrees to the rays. So if there was no aberrations, you would get a plain wavefront. So all the rays would be collimated here, so they'd all be parallel. In this case, the rays aren't parallel anymore, and 90 degrees to this is the wavefront. So the Zernike polynomials are describing the shape of this wavefront. So I'll just move on to the, the Zernike slide. So if we look, so if we look at the very first one, this is called so this is called piston. So this doesn't actually cause any aberrations. So this is just a translation of a plane wave. So it means the rays are still um, the st they're still all parallel. The light's still collimated. So although piston's part of the the triangle, it doesn't really cause aberrations. Now, if we move down the diagram here, so on the right, we've got radial order. And then so here we've got a radial order of one and we can see this is just tip and tilt. So this is put this would be the wavefront at a different angle. So still still flat, but at a different angle. And what the radial order means is the function describing the shape of this wavefront, if I was to take a slice across the wavefront, it would be it would be dependent on R. So R would be the, the radius um, as you move along the, the, the wavefront, it would just depend upon R. So you can imagine um, in, in 2D just a, a line, a straight line. So that's what radial order is. So now let's move down to radial order of two and we'll look at defocus. So this means that the shape of the wavefront, if I was to take a slice across the wavefront, it will be represented by R squared. So it's a parabolic, um, it's a parabola shape. So as you move down the radial order, um, the aberrations get more intricate. So radial order three just means that the highest order in the in the polynomial equation would be free. So there's an R to the R cubed term in the polynomial if I was describe looking at a slice across this wavefront. Call the azimuthal frequency. So let's start off with zero. So we'll go up here and we'll just look at defocus. So so zero means that the that it's rotationally symmetric. So imagine moving around the edge of this defocus term. Um, imagine that the parabola spinning, and it would be the same um, as you move around the wavefront. There would be no change. So it's symmetrical for zero. So let's now look at one. Let's have a look at vertical coma. Now a, a frequency of minus one means that as you move round 
the edge of the Zernike polynomial it's described by a sign with a frequency of one. So what you would see is there would be, if I was to look at this polynomial and plot it as I went round the edges, I would see that it would be described by a sine wave of a frequency minus one. And as you move across, um, this frequency gets higher, so you get more variations around the, the edge of the polynomial, the edge of the, the Zernike. Okay, uh, thanks for the answer. So we have another question from Ben Moon from USA. He asks, can you comment on the increased depth sectioning capabilities of confocal microscopy? Is there an increase in the fundamental axial resolution of a, for a con confocal system, or this is just due to the confocal gating, which re rejects light from other layers? So um, if you look at the point spread function we discussed earlier, that the point spread function of a confocal microscope is to a good approximation. The square of the point spread function of the equivalent conventional system. So that would give you a narrowing of the um, of the point spread function along the axis. But I think it's best to understand the aspects of the question asked here. It's best to think about the ability of the microscope to resolve a planar object. That is, for example, a thin layer of fluorescent material oriented perpendicular to the optical axis. Uh, because this, this shows you very, very clear way the difference between how a confocal microscope works and how a conventional microscope works. Because in a confocal microscope, you will only see the fluorescence from that layer when that layer is perfectly aligned with the um, focal plane. Because otherwise, fluorescence generated in that layer will not pass through the pinhole of the uh, detector. However, if you take a conventional microscope, which is equivalent to removing the pinhole in the system, and you move the fluorescent layer to different positions relative to the focal plane, then you will see the same amount of light reaching the detector for every particular position. So there will be no axial section or no axial response, if you like here. It will just be the constant intensity for every axial position of this fluorescent layer. So in that sense, it shows very clearly how the difference between axial sectioning, we call it, in the confocal microscope as opposed to in the equivalent wide field or, or conventional microscope. Thanks, Martin. Uh, what are the techniques we should combine to fluorescence microscopy for light cell imaging? Um, well, I think the the, the techniques for live cell imaging, aside from what we mentioned before, just as maintain, uh, keeping um, exposure levels low, uh, would a lot of it would be to do with uh, keeping the cells alive. And so that there are less optical issues and more sort of practical biological issues about keeping cells in an environment where they can actually survive. So that would include things like um, making sure you have the correct, uh, correct um, media around it, the correct, um, say, carbon dioxide or oxygen concentrations to keep them alive as well, and of course the correct temperature. Um, if you're most, say, looking at mammalian cells and you want to keep them at, um, not at room temperature, but at um, body temperature, 38 degrees, for example, in order to keep them um, um, behaving as cells do in their natural environment. So that would require the inclusion of, say, incubation stages around the microscope in order to maintain them at those properties. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Uh, Giovanna from Brazil is asking, in her laboratory, they currently use a PMT as a detector for two photon microscopy. Can you please specify what are the advantages of pocket detectors or it? Um, I think we touched on this before about the fact that you can you can use both and it's usually a question of which is sensitive enough at that particular wavelength. Um, APDs, uh, avalanche photodiodes, are made of silicon and so they have particular sensitivity profile, whereas photomultiplier tubes can be uh, have um, um, cathodes which are made of different materials, 
and so maybe sensitive at different wavelengths as well. Thanks for that. Uh, we have uh, Luca Baratelli from France asking, is there any technology available at the moment for real-time super resolution microscopy? If not, can this be a goal for future developments of the field? There are some methods. Um, some, some methods of super resolution microscopy are not conducive to this. Um, we and others have done live cell uh, imaging in, for example, uh, STED microscopes, which can be fast enough and scan fast enough to do this. Um, there's also some possibility, possibilities of doing this in structured illumination microscopes, as long as you can operate them quickly enough so that the frame rate is high enough to do this. Um, so yes, it is possible. It's not easy and it's limited to particular um, particular applications, but it can be done with super resolution microscopy. When you say you did live imaging, Martin, um, were the cells live at the end of the imaging in STED microscopy? Well, it depends how long you image for. <laughs> OK, <laughs> but, the, but the intensities are quite um, extreme aren't they i guess they've improved a lot but. it's true I mean, we had these conversations and the, you, you, it is true instead microscopy the, uh, the uh the the intensities are quite high compared to some other microscopies and that would reduce the lifetime of the of the, the specimen however you know i've spoken to a very very prominent um biologist collaborator of mine who said um he said well you know, i don't care what my cell is doing in a minute's time i want to know what it's doing now so as long as I can see it for the next few seconds, I don't mind if it's dead in a minute. So as long, depending on your application. Um, yeah, great answer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, maybe I can take the next question then. How do you know if a detected signal is due to multi-photon excited fluorescence or if it's due to optical bleed through of the NIR excitation light? Um, well, usually you would have a good optical filter in there which would prevent any realistic level of light from your laser getting back to your detector. So there, there shouldn't, with this proper design system, there shouldn't be any bleed through, no detectable bleed through. Um, another way of checking is to, uh, one advantage of two photon microscopy is that the fluorescence emission intensity will be proportional to the square of the illumination intensity. So one easy way of checking if you have two photon excitation is to uh, change the illumination power. So if you change the illumination power by a factor of two, so you went to, to, to a half, then you would expect the fluorescence intensity to go down to a quarter, which is of course a square of a half. And that would be a very clear indicator that you had two photon excitation. Thanks, Martin. OK, uh, Luigi is asking, in super resolution microscopy using structured light, how do you reconstruct the high frequency features from the moir fringes? Hmm. I suppose the, the simple answer to that is through a complicated computational process. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the the slightly more detailed answer to that would be well, it's, it's through. I mean, I'm, I have a background in uh, in electrical engineering, and we would refer to this as a form of um, demodulation or um, coherence detection. So you would um, you would basically uh, use the fact that the, you have a particular mathematical model which explains. The relationship between the images you take with these moiré patterns in them and the frequencies which are actually present in the object. So you're basically doing an inverse demodulation process there to uh, to retrieve what the original spatial frequencies were. And what you actually do in practice is you take the whole collection of images, each of which was taken with a different structured illumination pattern, and from that collection of images you use the mathematical model to estimate what the original structure was. So there are very many different ways of doing it, but in principle, that's what you're doing. You're estimating from the collection of images what the structure, original structure was, which gave you those images. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we have a question from Ashini. Without having a prior knowledge on the extent of aberrations or wavefront shapes, 
how would we pick one amongst those characters available? Would there be any assessment of the optimum amount of comma needed? Um, so, so if you if you don't know what your what present, um, so if you don't know what aberrations um, are present um, before you do it, I would I would recommend um, to just assume the worst case and and depending on on the funds available by the the corrector with the 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 highest performance. So what I mean is, um, so for mirrors, they're controlled by actuators that push the push and pull the back, the back of the surface of the mirrors. So the more of these actuators you have, the higher the Zernike um, polynomial you can correct. So as you go further down the pyramid, the aberrations change more spatially. So if you don't know what your aberrations are, I would suggest getting a high actuator count. Um, and also there's the issue of the, the magnitude of the aberrations. So like how much the surface can deform. Um, so, so generally, a high, I would probably go for a high-end corrector with a large number of actuators and a um, la and a high so-called stroke. Um, maybe Martin, um, you might. Uh, would, you, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Karen. Uh, Michael is he has a question from lecture three. Can you comment on difference between hardware aberration correction and reference phase subtraction? Can we remove aberrations computationally to the same extent as using hardware before the light interacts with the sample? Um, so there, there is some, there are studies coming out on on computational adaptive optics where they don't use any um, any. Um, any hardware to do the correction, but you do need to be able to to get a measurements of what's happening, what's happening in the sample. So, for example, you might need OCT. Um, so, so it is so it is possible, but I don't think computational AO is quite at the level where it can be used widespread on on lots of different samples and have it working really well. I don't think it's going to replace hardware AO for aberration correction um, yep. in the next few years. So ultimately, if you have aberrations in your imaging system, you are losing information. And unless you can retrieve that information, then you cannot you cannot retrieve it computationally. So you take an extreme case where your, your aberrations effectively blur the detail in your images. There's only a, a certain degree to which you can undo that blur. You can't create information which wasn't acquired by the microscope. So whilst in certain applications, coherent, particularly coherent imaging applications like OCT, you can retrieve phase information and then do um, a form of deconvolution afterwards, which they call computational adaptive optics. In something like fluorescence microscopy, where you've got often got low light levels and noise levels and so on, I think you will always, in mo many of the more tricky applications, the more difficult um, specimens, you will still require um, optical correction of the aberrations because you will not be able to retrieve all of the information computationally. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, next question is from Atachi Sari. So this question pertains to part three, slide seven. Can a special light modulator that changes the face of light be used to correct for aberrations? Um, so yeah, so so the really so the phase um, is also related to the optical path length, and so spatial light modulators, although the effect they're affecting the optical path length, which is um, affected by refractive index, they are actually manipulating the phase as well. So so yes, they, it is possible. Yeah, then that's how they're used. I think we're going to take our break for 30 minutes now because it's 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. If we just keep the schedule to give everyone a breather and let our presenters have a break from speaking and some tea, most importantly. Mm -hmm. OK, very good. See you back at uh, 1030. So um, just to avoid confusion, just Google Galway time or Irish time or UK time.
and uh, you will see what that means. Um, impressive to see the people from the Americas uh, up in the middle of the night asking questions. <laughs> so good to see you all here. Okay, see you back in 30 minutes. Bye. Thank you.
Hi, Martin. Hello. <laughs> Don't know if Aaron is back. Hi. Hi all. Um, I'm back, but I'm also on a teaching meeting, <laughs> so you know, it's one of uh, my tricks of bilocating during uh, COVID-19. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, um, oh, but more we, we can get ready to to get moving. Um, Aaron is doing a good job as, asking questions. Uh, if that's okay, we can continue with that. Um, and maybe I can get things started. So how are we doing? I think we're just on time. Shall we just jump into it? Yeah, is Arn ready to pass yeah. us over? Yeah, I can. Uh, just who wants to go live? So maybe I'll just say a quick few words and ask the first question and maybe Anand can can come on. Let's see if I can yeah. quieten down my other meeting. Yeah, OK. Perfect, right. you're live. Good to go. OK, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm just trying to see where we finished with our questions. Is, is the first one from Martina uh, using STED? How much can you do? Uh, can you go uh, under the diffraction limit? So the question is, how far can you go beyond the diffraction limit with STED microscopy? Um, so in theory, um, you could go down to atomic level. Um, in practice, uh, I think in the best, most controlled circumstances, the resolution has been taken down to around about 10 nanometers, but that was for um, objects called color centers inside diamond crystal, which are very well robust, very robust and very well behaved um, 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 atomic defects. So, there, so the ultimate thing has probably been shown to be a few nanometers, but this isn't realistic for, um, for bioimaging. In bioimaging applications, then more realistically, you might um, achieve resolutions down at the 30 nanometer level. And this is limited by various things, including um, so scattering, polarization errors, aberrations, uh, but also just by the labeling itself, because the um, there's also you also have to start thinking in super resolution microscopy about the precision with which you can place the markers. Because if you can only place the markers with a precision of 50 nanometers, then you're not going to gain extra information about your specimen, extra useful information about your specimen. Uh, if your resolution is below 50 nanometers for the optical system. So in those situations, other things start coming into place, which is the preparation, how you've prepared your specimens and how robust they are. In order to get the highest resolutions in stead microscopy, you have to turn up the depletion beam laser power quite high. And this is why the best resolutions have only been obtained in substances like diamond, diamond crystals, because they are very robust to this, um, this light intensity. If you tried to do the same thing in a biological specimen, you would probably destroy the specimen with the laser beam. So that's where one of the limits comes from in this. So you're probably limited in practice to around about 30 nanometers in biological specimens. All right, thanks Martin. Uh, the next question is, you mentioned that two photon fluorescence only can happen in one axial point. Why is this? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, so it can only happen where the, the two photons uh, meet. So it can only happen where the beam is focused because the, the, the two photons need to meet precisely to stimulate the two photon fluorescence. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a probability thing. So I suppose strictly speaking, you can get two photon emission outside of the focal plane because of the effect Karen's talking about it's far more probable to happen in the focal plane, so you have a much stronger signal from there. So occasionally you will detect something from outside, but actually it's only predominantly from that focal plane that you get fluorescence generated, and that's what gives you the resolution. Okay, 
thanks for that answer. Uh, we have another question from Atta Chizari. So, in case of imaging live and moving samples such as embryos, should the aberration correction and calculations be repeated or adjusted per acquired time, acquired frame? Um, so, so if things are moving around, it could happen that the aberrations could vary during the image image in time. Yeah, that, that could happen. So it would be good to uh, update the aberration correction if there's a lot of movement. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, how do you determine the correct sweet spot of the objective for a 10 micron pinhole? Is that is that question asked? The, the yeah, it uh, was one of no. the questions that was asked. How do you determine the correct sweet spot of the objective for a 10 micron pinhole? I'm not sure what's, what exactly that's asking. Maybe we could ask a, the person to clarify that question, maybe come back to it later. OK, yeah, mm -hmm. great. Uh, Another question. Uh, what is the typical field of view of a confocal microscope? Are the concepts of numerical aperture and field of view equivalent? Uh, no, then they're not equivalent. Um, the numerical aperture simply describes the angle related to the angle at which the lens focuses the light in the focusing cone. The field of view, on the other hand, is determined by other aspects of the lens and system design. So um, it depends very much from, uh, from um, objective lens to objective lens. Um, and it's also, in practice, it also depends if you have a camera-based microscope, it also depends upon the size of the camera chip and the magnification. Uh, but usually the objective lens itself will have a certain field over which the um, quality is acceptable, so aberrations and, and so on. And that may be, depending on, for high magnification, high NA lenses, that may be one or 200 micrometers, that size. But of course, if you go down to lower magnification lenses, then that field of view will be larger. OK, great. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, I would like to ask if the aberrations of a microscope only depends on the optical performance of its lenses or if there is some of the microscope types presented in the lectures that stands out for having less aberrations. Um, so, so do you mean about the, is the question about the design of the microscope? So there can, there can be, um, so if it's not designed carefully, there can be aberrations and that's usually due to the the optics, yeah. So you have to select the right lenses and components. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's also a difference in um, the aberrations may be the same in different microscopes, but the sensitivity of that particular type of microscope to the aberrations may be different. One clear example of that is with super resolution microscopes, which tend to be much more sensitive to aberrations than say confocal or two photon microscopes. And that's just because of the way in which the images are formed and the way in which they're sensitive to even smaller phase errors, errors in the, in the aberrations um, introduced by the system or introduced by the specimen. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the answer. Uh, next question is asked by Martin A. Cooper. Would the microscope need different aberration corrections for each of the Cernicke polynomial aberrations, or can one type of aberration correction placed in the setup correct for multiple? Um, so there will be. So typically, if there's aberrations in the system, there there are certain types that are, can be quite common. So, for example, if lenses are not correctly centered, you might have astigmatism. Um, so they might you might need to correct for multiple. Um, Zernike polynomials, um, if depending on on the design of the microscope and the alignment. So typically, um, yeah. So for example, if you if you corrected for astigmatism, there might be other aberrations, and so you would need you couldn't just correct astigmatism and then all the aberrations are gone. It just depends on what's present. But that's quite a common one: astigmatism and 
uh, coma uh, spherical aberration if if the lenses aren't correct. So there can be a few. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, we have next questions from Motesan. How can we compare the surface roughness from confocal microscopy? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, how can we compare the surface roughness from confocal microscopy? S surface roughness? Yeah, yeah, that's what he asks. Um, I suppose that depends on the scale of that roughness. If the roughness yeah, is yeah. on a scale comparable to the resolution of the microscope, so you know, say around about a micrometer or slightly lower, then you should be able to measure the shape of the surface. If, however, the roughness is smaller than that, then the confocal microscope will not be able to resolve those surface shape variations and therefore will not be able to measure the roughness. So the question of resolution we talked about earlier would be the important thing to look at there about whether or not the confocal microscope would be an appropriate tool to measure this. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, then Sorry, can, is, can I ask Martin, can you capture those spatial frequencies even if you can't image them? Can, can you capture and get some sense of the roughness? I'm talking about the Fourier plane, maybe there is some way to well, you could get some information if, if it's if there is information contained within that the spatial frequencies we talked about which pass through the lens then yes you would be able to get some information i guess if you looked at the um you looked at the scattering of the light into the um Fourier plane in other words the, the back pupil plane of the lens then you may see some structure in there which can be interpreted as telling you about the roughness and the scattering yeah, or maybe some off angle method or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. so if you, yeah, if you illuminated with a, <clears throat> a larger angle, so say you had a separate illumination system, which illuminated at a larger angle than you would normally have in your objective lens, then that could provide further information about the higher spatial frequencies or higher the fine. Great, but but not resolve them. It's just giving some information. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Okay, oh, the next question is from lecture two. Is it possible to track different types of molecules in a single molecule localization? Um, yeah, so, so I, I guess if you had um, uh, different molecules and different illumination lasers, then I, I can imagine that you could track different molecules. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, Giona from Brazil is asking a question from lecture three. Is the LCSLM adaptable to correct different different aberrations, that is different lenses, such as deformable mirrors and face plates? Um, so, so is the question about how good is the correction in comparison to other devices? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, so it kind of, it kind of depends on the application. So so the stroke, um, which is for example the peak to valley of the, if you imagine each Zernike polynomial has a, a peak to valley and the magnitude depends on aberrations. If you're going to correct aberrations of very high magnitude, then it will probably be best to go with a deformable mirror. So, so spatial light modulators, they do have, um, you, you can use phase wrapping, but um, if you need a really high stroke, I would go with deformable mirrors. So for example, if you were using the, if you were doing remote focusing and you wanted to perform aberration correction and, and use the corrective element to change the depth, then I, I would go with deformable mirrors. Okay, uh, thanks Karen. We have uh, another question from Ming Li. Is autofluorescence of the tissue or molecules a big issue for fluorescence microscopy? Um, it can be helpful in some cases. Um, it can be, it will provide background in other cases. If you, uh, a lot of autofluorescence tends to be um, 
a particular spectral bands. So you can, uh, if you if you were designing an experiment with fluorescent spikes, so you chose choose a fluorescent marker which is in a band which isn't compromised by autofluorescence, in which case you would be able, if there is autofluorescence present, you would be able to deal with it by choosing the fluorophores and your excitation and emission wavelengths appropriately. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martin. How do you make single layer beat for lateral resolution measurement? Um, yeah, this is one of those one of those things which is rarely explained, but um, the way the way I would make it is I would take the fluorescent bead suspension and dilute it quite a lot. Then I would take a very small drop of it and put it onto a cover slip and then let it dry. And when it dries, the beads tend to adhere to the surface of the cover slip. Um, they don't all stick, but some of them will. Then you would place a drop of water. Once it's dried, you then place a drop of water on it again and then seal that into a, into a specimen. And what you usually find is that many of those beads stay on the cover slip surface. What some people do is they also put other substances on as a form of form of glue in order to make sure they adhere um, better. But once you've done that, you then have many of those beads. Some of them will be floating around, but many of them will just be fixed on the surface and you'll be able to use them as reference points for your measurements. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, from what value can we say that the diffraction limit is beaten? Um, so if you, yeah, so, so the diffraction limit will depend upon the numerical aperture. So say, for example, you have your numerical aperture, you calculate the resolution and that's the diffraction limit for that particular system so anything if you were able to image beyond that so for example structures illumination then you can say that you've beat the diffraction limit so it's all relative to what the limit is for your optics okay thanks karen uh, next question is from julian can you comment on the photo bleaching problematics into photon microscopy is it something that you have to take into account given the power used? I think um, photo bleaching is a phenomenon which can be seen in any form of fluorescence microscopy. So um, the it's not necessarily worse in two photon. The reason is that um, a lot of photo bleaching, so the, the excitation of fluorescence in a two photon microscope is a nonlinear effect. But actually, so is most of the photo bleaching as well. So, um, for a given image brightness, let's say, the total amount of photo bleaching in a two photon microscope should be less than the total amount of photo bleaching in a confocal microscope, because in a confocal microscope, you will also be bleaching outside of the focal plane and not just in the focal plane. So, it's a bit of a complicated one answer with a complicated uh, sorry, question with a complicated answer. Um, but I think you just need to be aware in any, fo any fluorescence microscopy that photo bleaching is an issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martin. Uh, there is another question from Mothasam. What is the cases when deconvolution could be used to improve image quality? Um, so, so deconvolution can be used um, and it is often used, um, but I think if the aberrations are really high, it, it would be really difficult to perform it well. But it is the technique that's still still used. Yeah, I guess to, to do deconvolution with aberrations present, you would need to know what the aberrations are or be able to estimate them. And that's the challenge here. Deconvolution works well if you have a good model of your point spread function or your imaging properties of your microscope. But if there's unknowns in there, such as unknown aberrations, then that will complicate the procedure considerably and probably make it impractical. In fact, you'll see a lot of results, published results, uh, now in adaptive optical microscopy, where the argument is used that you only when you've corrected the aberrations can you then use the deconvolution. So in a way, the adaptive optics enables the deconvolution in that sense. If you try to do deconvolution on aberrated images, then you would end up with uh, very um, severely compromised um, 
images with lots of artifacts and uh, other problems in the deconvolution process. Thank you very much. What are the best ways to resolve plain diopter aberrations and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each method? So plain, plain diopter aberrations. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what um, you mean by it. Um, that's, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by plain diopter. Okay. Uh, um, maybe he, he it's a spelling mistake or something. Maybe like we can ask him to get back with more clarity. If that's OK. Yeah, so can we move on to the next question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What size beads would you, you use for measuring point spread function? Also regarding using structural illumination to reconstruct high frequency information. Are there specific areas of clinical application or biological research that directly benefit from specifically identifying high frequency features? So the, the first part of the question was what size beads to use for point spread function measurements. Yeah. Um, well, if you're trying to measure a point spread function, you want an object which is as close as possible to a point. Um, so that would tell you you need the smallest bead possible you can get hold of. The problem with that approach is that um, smaller beads have smaller amounts of fluorescent markers in them, so you'll have lower signals. So the smallest possible beads may be too dim to actually detect in your microscope. So you need a compromise between making the bead as small as possible and having it big enough that you have sufficient signal. So um, what you would usually try initially is something which is five to ten times smaller than the expected resolution of the microscope. So you might, for example, use a 50 nanometer bead or a 40 nanometer bead. If in your particular microscope you cannot detect that because it's too dim, then you would have to move up to say a 100 nanometer bead. But then you would have to bear in mind that you're now trying, you know, your object isn't like a point anymore, it's actually larger, so you'd have to factor that into your measurement. But we mentioned deconvolution. If you if you know that you have a particular size bead and you know the size of it, then you can do a form of deconvolution to retrieve the PSF, even though you used a larger bead. So the other part of the question was about why why was it essentially why you would use or for what applications you would use structure? Uh, yeah. Um, In which applications you would want like distinguishing high frequency components? Well, it, it, if you can measure, I suppose the way to think about this is if you can detect higher spatial frequencies, then you can resolve smaller objects. So these two things go hand in hand. There are two ways of looking at the same problem. So what we're basically saying by resolving those higher frequencies, it means we can actually resolve smaller objects when we reconstruct the image. So anything where we are looking at objects which are smaller and cannot be resolved by the current diffraction limit of microscopes, but are, um, you know, but are in that correct range, then, then that would be with this. There's plenty of structures inside biological cells where you might want to look at, say, separations of proteins or uh, positions of membranes um, where they're where you cannot quite resolve them using standard microscopes and it's those situations where you'd want to use super resolution microscopes like structured illumination thanks martin the next question is from a little bit of electrical engineering perspective so i would like to ask a question about the pmt's the PMTs are known for having to be shielded from ambient light to prevent their destruction through overexcitation. The system I previously worked on had a simple mechanical protection to keep the photomultiplier compartment closed. I understand that this protection can be achieved by implementing some external circuitry as well, but I never had a chance to work on this. Could you please quickly elaborate on most common electrical engineering methods for a specific application? Well, I know that some PMT modules which you can buy from manufacturers do have protection on them. So if they become overexposed, they, they shut down. So what they need to do is work out if there's the electronics needs to detect if there's a spike in the signal, 
and that's when it detects a spike in the signal to shut down the amplification effect. So in some ways, this is a relatively simple thing to do. You just detect the signal at the output. Then you would use that to uh, control the voltages you're applying to the dynodes, which are the amplification devices, and just make sure you shut them down quickly enough that you can't get catastrophic runaway in the uh, in the cascade effects through the dynodes. Um, in yeah, so so if you if you have to if you cannot use mechanical protection for this, just by for example enclosing the systems and making sure that light cannot get directly from the laser to the PMT, then you'd put in some protective circuitry like this. But as I said, many PMT modules will have this built in anyway now if you need it. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, next question is from David McMahon. What are the standing research questions facing adaptive optics? Um, do you want to have a go at that, Karen, first? There's plenty. Um, <laughs> so, it looks um, like a very broad question. So, um, so do you mean what are the limits of adaptive optics? Is that what I the... What the I think, was it what are the outstanding research questions? Is that the question? Is that what this is? Yeah, or what are the standing research questions facing adaptive optics? Okay. I think yeah. in the, the challenges. Um, what are the challenges? Yeah working on oh <laughs> yeah so so one of the um uh, one of the main challenges and the, this is something that we're working on is that when you implement adaptive optics it only corrects over a small region that it's looking at so suppose you're imaging a specimen specimen in wide field the the adaptive optics correction is only applicable over a small small area and that's because as you move along the sample the adaptive optics correction you need will be different so in one place it will be different to an another place in the image so that's one of the challenges um so to correct to do this problem what you use is multi-conjugate adaptive optics so there's relative there's different ways to implement it um, but one of the one of the common methods is to use multiple correctors. So in effect, you get a correction over the full um, region of the sample. Now, the issue with that is if you start adding lots of deformable mirrors to a system, it makes the system extremely complicated and also it makes um, the system extremely expensive. And so in order to adopt widespread use, um, it's hard to take up this technology because it, it makes it the system so complicated. So one of the things we're working on at the moment is working on a device specifically designed for microscopy where you can slip a small um, device in into the system that contains, for example, lots of um, different transmissive elements. Now, the difficulty with that is that every specimen is different. So if you designed a device for one case and then you had a different sample, you'd have to, um, you, you would require a different um, different properties of the correctors. So one of the main challenges um, in microscopy is determining a device that's going to be applicable across many different samples. So I would say that's one of the main challenges. Also as well, typically um, scattering is not corrected. Um, so there, there has been some demonstrations of correcting scattering using, for example, spatial light modulators, and that will also improve the image, but um, it's not at the level yet where you can insert a device, correct scattering, correct all the aberrations across the full region. So I think that's the main research challenges at the moment, is making adaptive optics um, easier to use, low cost, uh, less hardware. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thanks very much, Ken. <clears throat> Next question is: How much can objectives resist against high exposure of lasers without damaging? Um, so, so when you buy um, optical components, they always have a damage threshold. Um, so, so typically the, this is quoted. So I guess if you're um, using high power lasers, just check the manufact with the manufacturer. 
what the damage threshold is because high power lasers can do damage but there are you know if you pick the correct optics then it should be fine should should also point out in that respect that the um, as long as you're careful not to focus a beam into the material of the lens so if you, you know normally these these lenses of course you have a collimated beam an expanded beam entering them and it stays pretty much expanded all the way through the elements and only gets focused outside of the elements as long as that's the situation you're highly unlikely in a microscope to damage the objective lens unless you inadvertently focus on the lenses themselves uh, we use in other areas of our work we use um, microscope objectives in laser machining systems and they are using far higher pulse energy lasers than we use in microscopes and even there where we're putting in you know perhaps even 10 watts of pulse laser power you don't damage the lens because the beam is expanded and so the power density is small however if you took those lasers and focused it into a lens you would create damage inside the lens material itself but that doesn't generally happen in a microscope thank you very much how practical and 